My friends, as we segue from some of the more recent, the church approved apparitions to some of the reported apparitions, and with the clear disclaimer, we're not at all uh, referring to each and every approved apparition uh, in the age of Mary, nothing even close, but hopefully you're getting a sense of the Marian message of the modern world. I do want to make reference to the approved apparitions at Kibeho, Rwanda, uh, which took place in the 1980s and uh, had their approval in the 1990s. Uh, Our Lady of Kibeho, and just a quick word on the uh, very powerful Kibeho apparitions. Our Lady of Kibeho comes uh, and brings a message of the word, a message of the gospel, uh, the same Marian message, prayer and penance and rosary. And also bespeaks very serious upcoming chastisements to the region itself. In fact, on one of the visions, uh, one of the days of the visions, that the visionaries uh, were weeping uh, in, in, in such uh, strong fashion that uh, it became known as a, a day of particular mourning because the children were given visions of rivers filled with blood, bodies cascaded, upon another. And the objection at the time by some was, well, this can't be the Blessed Mother because the Blessed Mother wouldn't scare these visionaries. And the visionaries at Cabejo were fundamentally a high school age children or young adults. And then later, we all saw that vision, if you will, uh, on CNN during the, 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 the tragic, the, the infamous slaughter, uh, the genocide in Cabejo where almost one million uh, People were killed by machete, the vast majority by machete, uh, and it was a Hutu uh, racial uh, ethnic ethnic battle uh, between the the Hutus and the Tutsis. The Tutsis were uh, predominantly Catholic as well, as as Rwanda has a very high uh, Catholic population. And so that which was prophesied by the children, by the young adults, by the teenagers, in fact took place in Rwanda during the tragic genocide. And so these apparitions did receive the Constate Supernaturalitate designation, and rightly so, and uh, continue to be uh, a critical message for the world to convert to avoid elements of catastrophe. Now we also have the first American apparition, which was given a Constate de Supernaturalitate uh, by the bishop, Bishop uh, David Rickens of uh, the Diocese of Green Bay uh, with Our Lady of Good Health. And with these apparitions, uh, which happened in the middle of the 19th century, there's also a, a phenomenal uh, story and uh, really documentation of a visionary being called uh, to be an evangelist and actually having to work by babysitting the children so that she would have access to evangelize, to evangelize them. And this does take place. And then there is the historic uh, Chicago, uh, Wisconsin fire uh, from Chicago into Wisconsin and uh, arguably the largest recorded fire in U.S. history. And remarkably, in fact, supernaturally, the fire rages through the area where the church of the apparitions uh, is located. And there's only a little picket fence protecting it, and it devastates the area around it, uh, being eaten by the fire, if you will, uh, but the church and the location is saved. So the proclamation, the declaration by Bishop Ricken uh, on December 8th, some, a few years ago, of the first approved American apparition. Now, in going to, and again, there are other approved apparitions which we're not going to get into in in great detail, but uh, I do want to segue into the reported Marian apparition, which along with the campaign for the Fifth Marian Dogma has received the greatest press attention, not only in terms of Catholic press, but also in terms of secular media uh, than any other Marian event, and that would be the reported apparitions at Medjugorje. Church status. Let me give a brief summation of what can be a somewhat complex history in terms of official church status. The apparitions uh, under the title of Queen of Peace start on June 24th of 1981. And 
For the first six months, the bishop, Bishop Zanich at the time, defended the visionaries against the communists, saying, the children do not lie. Later, slightly later, uh, there is a Franciscan diocesan conflict at a neighboring parish. This is a parish some hour plus away from St. James Parish in Medjugorje, which is also uh, operated by the Franciscan, served by the Franciscan order. Well, this diocesan Franciscan event that happened uh, in, again, in a parish uh, well over an hour away, caused the bishop to reverse his position on Medjugorje, and from that point was against Medjugorje. He established a commission, which was rather hand-picked, as, as the members of the commission stated, hand-picked for those who were, in fact, against the apparitions. Uh, the apparitions came out with a negative conclusion. It was sent to the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith in Rome. Essentially, Cardinal Ratzinger said that the proper work was not done and sent it back to the ex yugoslav now the Bosnian Episcopal Conference, to do a new, more objective uh, evaluation according to the criteria of the Church, the 1978 uh, Seper, Colonel Seper documents. Now, what then takes place is a new commission under the Episcopal Conference, the Conference of Bishops there, and in 1991 there's what is called the Zadar Statement, and the Zadar Statement establishes Medjugorje in the middle category of the non constat de supernaturalitate. That is, once again, based on our previous lectures, not the approval category, not the prohibition category, but the middle category. Not approved, but not prohibited. The bishops in their Zadar statement also said, while they're not confirming the supernatural character at this time, they do allow pilgrimages to continue, even pilgrimages based on belief in the authenticity of Medjugorje, and as well established that the bishops themselves would offer uh, pastoral care to the pilgrims. Now, if you will recall in previous lectures, in that condemned category, the constat de non supernaturalitate, this, this is not of a supernatural origin, there is also the clear pastoral counsel, stay away, do not come, do not visit the apparition site because it's not an authentic apparition site as the church has designated at this point. And so there is no sense of encouraging pilgrims to come, let alone the uh, commitment to care for their pastoral needs, as we find in the 1991 document uh, of the Yugoslav, ex-Yugoslav bishops, the Bosnian bishops uh, at Zadar. So, Medjugorje is in that middle category, and it continues to be in that middle category. Uh, in 1997, uh, there, at that time, the Archbishop Secretary of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, uh, Archbishop Bertone, uh, answered a parish, uh, a, a, a Parisian bishop, a bishop from Paris, asking, can pilgrims go to Medjugorje? And it was a fascinating response because Archbishop Bertone <coughs> to me, later to be Cardinal Bertone, said a couple interesting things. First of all, yes, private pilgrimages may go, meaning one's not officially organized by the bishop, but it could also include priests. He also established that the personal opposition of the local bishop is his own position, but it is not the official position of the church. The official position of the church is the 1991 Zadar Statement. And it's rare that the Vatican will speak directly against a personal position of the bishop, but in this case, it was based on a lack of objectivity in the process deemed by the church as legitimate for examining an apparition. And so, it is the 1991 Zadar Statement which remains the official position. Bring it up to date, by May of 2015, there is... Uh, a commission, a Vatican commission that has completed its work and has presented its work to Pope Francis, and it will be Pope Francis's ultimate decision about the final uh, establishment of authenticity or category regarding authenticity regarding Medjugorje. The Vatican commission was made up not only of some people from the Bosnian region, but also Vatican officials. So, the present status of Medjugorje uh, to date remains the non constat de supernaturalitate, not approved, not condemned, pilgrims, private pilgrims are free to go. Now, having said that, 
let's talk about the message of Medjugorje. The message which started again June 24th of 1981 and continues to this day by some of the visionaries is a message of faith, prayer, fasting, conversion, and peace. Faith, prayer, fasting, conversion, and peace. And let's go through uh, each of those designations because they, they, they really do summarize a, a critical foundation of the Medjugorje message. Excuse me. The theme of faith, according to the visionaries, and I, I want to also, uh, just for the sake of objectivity, state very clearly my own personal strong belief in Medjugorje's authenticity. Uh, I believe Medjugorje is absolutely authentic. Of course, I will always submit to the final and definitive judgment of the church, but I do so based on the criteria of the church. Uh, the message content is absolutely clear of any doctrinal error, even after uh, some 30 plus years of apparitions. The phenomena reported at Medjugorje, both in terms of ecstasy and also in terms of some of the supernatural elements, are completely in line with the mystical tradition of the church. And thirdly, the spiritual fruits have been phenomenal. Over 33 million people have visited Medjugorje. Great churchmen like Cardinal Schönborn, the secretary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, has said publicly on several occasions, if it wasn't for Medjugorje, my seminaries would be empty and has invited one of the visionaries, Ivan, to have apparitions uh, in the Cathedral of St. Stephen in Vienna. So there have been over 200 bishops who have personally pilgrimaged to Medjugorje, as the church permits, and a great number of them have written testimonies to the authenticity of the apparitions. So while I personally have a very strong belief in its authenticity, I will also try to serve by an objective analysis based on the church's criteria. And parenthetically, let me mention that when one uses a criteria stronger than the church, more rigid than the church, more, if you will, immaculate than the church, it doesn't serve. Uh, and, and reason being, if we take the example of Jesus Christ and his apostles, if one says, well, there is that Matthew, I mean, if Jesus was really divine, he would have known that he was a tax collector. There's Judas, if Jesus was really divine, he wouldn't have had a, you know, a betrayer with him. And there's certainly the Mary Magdalene, who's among the disciples, in other words, if ad hominem attacks based on uh, and directed towards individuals uh, surrounding the apparitions become the criteria rather than message, phenomena, and fruit, uh, then no apparition would stand uh, the test. And in fact, Jesus himself would not stand the test in terms of uh, elements that are properly used to discern the Spirit of God and legitimate authenticity, authentic works of God. And so I would say again, uh, there's a certain discipline and a certain prudence and a certain justice to keeping to the church's criteria. Now, having said that, let's go through the message briefly. First of all, the message of faith. According to the visionaries, Our Lady asks for a greater faith in Jesus Christ as the one mediator to the Father. He says very specific, our Lord, excuse me, uh, Blessed Mother says specifically in the messages that uh, all religions are not equal and so there's no sense of a false ecumenism in the message. Jesus Christ is the one mediator to the Father. And she also asks for faith in the apparitions themselves as an as a occasion for particular grace. Now, also in the Medjugorje message, there is a promise of a permanent visible sign for the, quote, unbelievers. Something people can come and see which will assist them in accepting the authenticity of Medjugorje. We mentioned before that Akita perhaps has a reference to a sign. We will mention in future lectures uh, places like uh, Garabandal, uh, another reported apparition, but an apparition that was very strongly endorsed by Padre Pio. Uh, and even though St. Pio is not the magisterium and not the local bishop, he's pretty wise in terms of discerning uh, heaven from hell and, and our Lord from elements of Satan. Very strong uh, defender uh, and promoter of Garabandal. And also, Garabandal, there's a reference, as we'll discuss, of a permanent sign to assist unbelievers. So that is an element of the Medjugorje message as well. Second theme is the theme of prayer. 
At Medjugorje, Our Lady is asking for a clearly greater quality and quantity of prayer, what she calls prayer of the heart, a greater interior prayer. And with this call of greater quality of prayer, there's also very clearly a call for more generosity in prayer. As one author said at Lourdes, it seemed to be uh, an initial reference of Our Lady praying the rosary by example. At Fatima, Our Lady calls for five decades of the rosary. Well, at Medjugorje, she has called for the 15 decade rosary daily. And if one is quick to dismiss this as just impossible in the present world, it might be good to keep in mind that St. John Paul II got 15 decades in each day. And because he did, a certain a Bishop Bergoglio was inspired to do the same, and therefore Pope Francis also gets in his 15 decades. So they have rather packed schedules, uh, rather significant uh, uh, calendars, and yet they get their prayers in. So perhaps it's not as impossible of a request as one might think at first glance. So the 15 decade rosary daily, Our Lady calls for uh, Mass to be the, quote, gift of the day for the faithful. She has called for Eucharistic adoration, for consecration of each individual to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and of course the daily reading of Scripture. So it's a beautiful, sacramental, liturgical call to prayer. The third message of Medjugorje is the call to fast. In fact, in 1981 she started with a call to fast strictly on Fridays, and by 1984 she added Wednesday to a day of strict fast. So Wednesday, Friday, strict fast. What's fascinating about this historically is this was precisely the, pra the fasting practice of the Christian community in the first centuries. In fact, in the classic document, the ancient document, the Didache, the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, written somewhere between 60 and 120 AD, it specifies in a directive to Christians, you Christians are to fast on Wednesdays and Fridays. So Wednesday and Friday are specific days of Christian fast. And traditionally, the Wednesday fast is in reparation for the betrayal of Judas. The Friday fast is in reparation and in unity with our crucified Jesus. So it is not as if Our Lady of Medjugorje is calling for a new practice as much as a return to the more generous penitential life of the early church. Uh, fasting, uh, one should keep in mind, is the great one to punch along with prayer. Jesus says in the Gospels, after some try to exercise, some of his disciples try to exercise demons and are unsuccessful, our Lord reminds them that this type is only removed through prayer and fasting. So think of fasting as a type of prayer of the body, not for self-discipline, not for dieting, but to in fact participate body and soul in our unity with Jesus and for our own self-discipline and most of all to offer sacrifices of co-redemption for the mystical body of Christ. Now the theme of conversion is centered very much on the sacrament of confession or reconciliation. In fact, the, the, the call of conversion in the Medjugorje message is very much like the call of conversion in St. John the Baptist's preaching and teaching, and it's interesting that the apparitions start on the Feast of St. John the Baptist. Now, Our Lady has said that confession is a, quote, medicine for the church in the West, and that whole regions of the church will return to the church through the Sacrament of Reconciliation. So she calls for an at least once a month reception of the Sacrament of Confession. The fifth theme, peace, which to some degree could be misunderstood, is first and foremost a call for the peace of Jesus Christ in the heart of the believer. How does one obtain this peace of Jesus Christ? Through greater prayer, faith, fasting, and conversion. Indeed, peace is a gift of the Holy Spirit that comes in virtue of the fruit of conversion. Now, the spiritual peace of Christ received by the individual is then supposed to blossom into family peace, community peace, and then ultimately even global peace. But first and foremost, it is a call of the spiritual peace of Jesus Christ in the heart. And that is her title at Medjugorje, the Queen of Peace. 
Now, there is also, as we've seen in every authentic message up to this point, there is also some reference to conditional chastisement. The children at uh, the youth, of course, uh, now adults at Medjugorje, received a series of secrets, some of which had to do with local events, others have to do with global events. Of the most significant event, uh, a spiritual director, a Franciscan priest, has been chosen. The visionaries will give the contents of the secret to the priest, and then he will pray and fast, and it will be up to him on how he wants to uh, notify the world about the upcoming event. Some, again, can quickly get allergic to the idea of secrets. What's the secret stuff? It sounds kind of, you know, uh, questionable. Remember, at Lourdes, there are three secrets that St. Bernadette is given. At Fatima, we have three secrets as well. What's the purpose? What's the value of a secret? It's how Our Lady can get some people praying and fasting for something very important without causing hysteria, without causing a fear epidemic, rather something given to those uh, responsible that can lead to conversion and peace. Now, I would also say, in light of the reality of, of, of chastisement in the message, let's also get a, a good Catholic theology of chastisement. And I, I would, I would uh, identify two kind of pillars to this. One is, chastisements permitted by God are always providential. That is, going back to the plagues of the Old Testament, probably our best example of the theology of chastisement. First of all, they're conditional. Secondly, they're leading to conversion. They're leading to the will of God being enacted by the people. It's unfortunate that Pharaoh's hardness of heart doesn't have him uh, stop with blood in the Nile. It leads to the death of his own son. But ultimately, the ways of God are fulfilled. So, first of all, never have an atheistic concept of chastisement as if God has lost control of things. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a vengeful, angry chaos that's taking place. This would be an atheistic uh, or an agnostic concept of chastisement, not a Christian concept. Abba Father, as one author says, it sometimes uh, resembles more the, the divine spank from the Abba Father. Uh, and that's not to lighten the gravity of chastisement, things that, for example, at Akita, fire falling from the sky and uh, the, the, the Fatima, October uh, 13th miracle of the, the sun coming down, and, and perhaps there could be something of a nuclear prediction in that as well. Whatever it be, God permits it for the greater salvation of souls. The reality is, my friends, that sometimes only when the material support that so many depend on has been removed do we return to our knees and return to God. And God would rather allow temporary material disaster and save eternal souls. That's love. That's a father's love. And that's the proper understanding of chastisement. So in the second element, the second pillar is, remember, chastisement is always conditional. If the world converts, uh, we saw this with the Fatima message, we could have avoided, had the word world converted properly said, we could have avoided the Second World War. So these events are conditional for the good of souls. And I would leave you with the Medjugorje message uh, with a particular message that was received from Yelena. Yelena was the young girl that was a locutionist along with the six principal visionaries. And Our Lady appeared to her on a day when she had read a book and, uh, as a young, you know, she was maybe 10 or 11 years old, someone had given her a book uh, on the third secret of Fatima before the third secret was released in the year 2000. And it it bespoke a number of uh, catastrophes and, and, and uh, apostasies and whatnot. And Yelena was disconcerted. She was upset. Our Lady came to her that day and said essentially this message. Do not concentrate on wars, chastisements, and evil. This is the first way to enter into them. Your duty is to accept divine peace and to live it. And I think if any single message summarizes the overall message of Medjugorje, it would be that one. Your duty is to accept divine peace and to live it. Indeed, what Our Lady says is accurate. If one is focusing on wars and chastisement, you can only grow in anxiety. A reality of these events are part of the message. So to acknowledge their reality is a legitimate thing. To focus, to concentrate them on them, 
over the mercy of God or over the peace and grace Our Lady brings is to completely misunderstand the message and the mission. So, the message of Medjugorje has ultimately the call to accept divine peace and to live it. And we will await the final decision of Pope Francis on the status of Medjugorje uh, and the fulfillment. But all of the elements in an, in an honest investigation uh, based on church criteria uh, come forward very favorable for Medjugorje. Certainly the message, free from error, the phenomena, especially the ecstasy tested, the visionaries being tested by a French and Milan team, uh, and both medical teams come into the conclusion that the children are in communication with someone supernatural. And the fruits have certainly been worldwide uh, in extraordinary generosity. These all portend very well for the Medjugorje message and the living and the graces of the Queen of Peace. In our following lecture, we will continue uh, with reported apparitions and also designating uh, their status in the church, uh, leading up to a good understanding of what is presently available. And once again, I want to establish it's important that a student of Mariology is going to have an essential grasp, not only just on the approved messages, but the messages that are being spoken about in the press, the, the messages that are being discussed in, in global and, and internet dialogue, because this is part and parcel of seeking the truth and being one in the discerning church and always, always staying true to the magisterium. That's the ultimate defense and support is obedience to the magisterium of the church regarding any private revelation. Thank you.